Thanks, Pastor Raj. And if you are uh, in junior high, grade six to eight, you can head on upstairs, junior high catechism going on. And just a note on that, by the way, also good morning. Glad that, really? I, man, you guys should be way, on, way more on it. First service was way more excited about all this than you guys were. You got extra sleep. What's up with that? Good morning. Good morning. Love it. Just a note on junior high catechism. You know, we've, uh, we started this a few months ago. Uh, Miss Jean and I came to a couple in our church, a beloved couple, Chad and Sarah Freeman. Sarah was up here doing announcements this morning, and they just took the desire to have our students learn the core tenets of faith in question and answer format, which is what catechism is all about, and they ran with it. And there is something awesome that's going on upstairs as uh, kids in grade six to eight just learn more about the core tenets of our faith. And so if you know Chad or Sarah, if you see them, uh, make sure you just uh, thank them, make sure you encourage them, even as we consider what we learned about last week from Philippians chapter 2, and, uh, and just, just bless them as they're doing such a valuable work. There's a lot of you in here this morning. It's good to see you. It's good to be together. It is good to get God's word open together. So as Pastor Roger said, Philippians chapter 3 is where we're going to be this morning as we continue this series, Joy Unleashed, looking at what it means for us to receive the supernatural delight of God in our lives as we pursue him together. So Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11 is where we're going to be this morning. I hope you're turning there. And as you are, it's amazing to think about the lengths that people will go to for something that they deem worth it, isn't it? When somebody thinks that it is, it is worth their time, their energy, or effort, they will go to great lengths, and it's amazing the lengths that they will go to. Black Friday is like the perfect example of this, by the way. You ever think about that? The one kind of nice thing about, I guess, like physical distancing is that it's, it's like quelled the chaos of Black Friday over the last two years, I suppose. But like Black Friday is a perfect example of the lengths that people go, will go to for a deal. Camping out late at night in front of the store, like trampling other people to get that brand new TV or like willing to risk their own lives in the human stampede in order to get a deal that they deem worth it. It's crazy, isn't it? You see, the worth that we attribute to something determines how much we value it. And so I wonder what you'd be willing to do for what you consider is worth it in your life. What would you be willing to do for family? What would you be willing to do for friends? I wonder what you'd be willing to do even for your pets. There's a lot I could say about that. What about your hobbies? Your sports teams? Sorry, I had to go there. Forgive me. Or your kids' sports teams? What about that one? Or how about this? What would you be willing to go, what lengths would you be willing to go to for more money? Or more power? And I wonder if those lengths are the same that you'd be willing to go to for Jesus. See, the Apostle Paul in our passage this morning, specifically in chapter 3, verse 8, says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And can you say the same? Would you be willing to count everything in your life as loss for Jesus Christ? What would you be willing to do for the sake of Jesus? You see, if Jesus really is everything to me, then my life in every part should reflect that. So let's read the passage that God has for us this morning. If he, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. Follow along with me as I read. These are God's words to us this morning. Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself has, have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. See, when Jesus is everything to me, when I truly understand the surpassing worth of Jesus Christ, when I really recognize and believe how vastly superior he is, Compared to anything and everything in my life, see this first, I'm done with worthless things. I'm done with anything that takes me away from Jesus Christ. Paul kind of eases into our passage this morning in verse 1. He gives, he gives the Philippians a loving and, and gentle reminder to be filled with joy. A poignant statement for him to make, by the way, considering that he was writing this from prison in Rome. Have joy, he says. But it's the same thing that he's told these Philippians over and over and over again. And I have to wonder, I have to wonder, knowing the amount of times that Paul says rejoice in the book of Philippians, I have to wonder if, if this time the Philippians are like, okay, Paul, I get it, right? A little bit of maybe some eye roll action going on here. Here's Paul telling us rejoice again. Kind of like the same kind of thing that we do sometimes when we get to church. It's okay, let's be honest with one another right now, Right? Sometimes you come here, you sit down, you get your Bible open, you're like, nah, the same old thing, different Sunday, right? Not you guys, though, not today, because you got extra sleep, right? You're good to go. The truth of the matter is, we are hearing the same things every week. We are hearing the same things because it's necessary for us to hear the same things over and over again. Why? Because we mess up all the time, don't we? The things that we hear on Sunday are out of our minds by Wednesday, and truthfully, that's probably being generous. The way to blessing, the way to true joy in our lives is what Paul goes on to say. It is to be in the Lord. It is to be living for him. And it's Paul's job to continue to remind the Philippians of this. It's no trouble to me, he says. Because to be in the Lord, to have joy, supernatural delight in God, in his word, in his purposes, in his plans, in his people. To be in Christ is what brings us security, Paul says. It is safe for you. To be in the Lord with the joy that comes from that is the safest place for us to live. Then he goes on into verse two and kind of drops the hammer a little bit. Check it out. He says, look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for the mutilators of the flesh. I read these things and I'm like, man, Paul would have been ruthless on Twitter, right? Like these, this is some strong stuff that he's saying here. Okay, and it isn't just that Paul is trying to be derogatory. These statements are hitting with cutting significance, dripping with irony. He cautions the Philippians who were Gentiles, who were non-Jews, to be careful of, specifically, Jewish believers called Judaizers, who while believing in Jesus, erred critically in believing that salvation was Jesus plus something else. Judaizers believed, Judaizers believed it was Jesus plus Jewish law. Jesus plus dietary restrictions. Jesus plus rituals. Essentially, it was Jesus plus works for them. Sound familiar? Something we so easily slip into in our lives. And Paul calls these people first dogs. Now, just as a side here for a moment, please resist the urge, parents, to use this verse as a uh, way to make sure that your kids don't get a dog, okay? As much as you may be tempted to, as I was this week, not what Paul's talking about here, okay? Dogs were viewed decidedly differently back then than they are today, okay? Paul's not talking about your nice little Yorkie Terrier who licks your face when you sit on the couch, okay? Dogs back in this time were unclean. 
They ate dead things. They ate garbage. But more significantly, dogs was a term that Jews used for Gentiles who were unclean to them in comparison. But here, Paul is saying that it's these Jews who believe that they have some part to play in their earning of salvation who are the dogs, not Gentiles. Secondly, Paul calls them evildoers. These Jews believe that based on their being born into the people of God, that their works, which they boasted about as being good and good enough and deserving of blessing, are in fact evil. Their claim to righteousness based on what they do, as Paul says in Galatians 3.10, had them under a curse, and that curse was their own self-righteousness. Their own self-centeredness. Not God-centeredness, the way that they thought it was. And hatred for others as a result. This made them, in effect, spiritual Gentiles. Third, And most significantly, Paul calls this group mutilators of the flesh. In the original language, this is actually a pun. And I have to guess that where the first two statements Paul made maybe made some of his readers snicker a little bit, this one probably made them laugh out loud. Paul's referencing the fact that Jewish males were commanded to be circumcised. I don't need to go into any detail as to what that is, right? We're all good with that. We know what we're talking about. Just nod your heads with me if if we're good. Awesome. Thanks. For the six of you who did that, appreciate it. The issue Paul's getting at here is the unrighteous confidence that came for these Jews from the fact that they were and the Gentiles weren't. It was a problem for them because their faith was in the wrong place. Their confidence in salvation rested on the physical, not the inward, not the reality of a heart that was truly changed by Jesus Christ, but by this outward ritual. The hard attitude that came from their confidence in circumcision, Paul likens to pagans who used to mutilate their bodies in worship to false gods. Unthinkable for Jews to be compared to. And Paul caps it off and drives it home in verse 3 by saying, for we, speaking of himself and the Philippians, these Gentiles, for we, these Gentile believers, we are the circumcision. See, it's not by the physical works that we are saved. It's not by our obedience that we are saved. It is by the inward spiritual transformation that results in the very core of who we are when we are baptized into the Holy Spirit, receiving the Spirit of God upon our conversion to Jesus Christ, are confessing with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and are believing in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, which changes where we place our confidence. No longer do we glory in ourselves. No longer do we glory in what we are able to do. We glory in Jesus Christ, Paul is saying not by the works of our flesh. And take it in a step fur- taking it a step further, Paul illustrates this by saying that if anyone had the utmost reason for confidence in the flesh, it was him. But these things to Paul are worthless now because Jesus was everything to him. And if Jesus is everything to me, then I'm going to be done with these worthless things that Paul goes after. See first, I'm going to be done with pursuing privilege above Jesus Christ. See, Paul was born with with Jewish privilege in spades. Verse 4 details that he was was circumcised on the eighth day, which was required in in Levitical law, Leviticus 12, verse 3. He was of the people of Israel. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And one of the main things that's lost on us there is the significance of Paul being in the tribe or of the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was one of the only two tribes of Israel that remained loyal to the Davidic line, which of course was the line prophesied to uh, have the Messiah come from. Okay, and the tribe of Benjamin were, were critical in the rebuilding of the temple after, after the Israelite exile. This was, this was an appreciated, even coveted heritage for Jews. This held weight for them. You see, family legacy is a fine thing. It's a fine thing. 
It is an awesome thing. It's a blessing to grow up in a family where you are taught the things of God, where you are pointed to Jesus Christ. And that most certainly can have an impact in you living for Jesus Christ. Being a godly husband, a godly wife, a godly father, mother, son, daughter, that's all good and commanded. But listen, those things alone give you no claim in salvation. To believe that you have some sort of privilege in the eyes of God based on physical things like the family that you were born into misses the mark. I mean, Jesus said strikingly in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. See, Jesus isn't trying to just destroy the family here. He's laying the groundwork for our understanding of his worth and our need to elevate him above everything else. Compared to your love of Jesus, it should be like you hate your own mother, your own father, your own son or daughter. It should be as if you hate even your own life, Jesus is saying, compared to your love for me. Too many of us are clinging to some sort of Christian privilege, believing that it's enough to get us into heaven, whether it's our family, whether it's past works. I've done enough to get saved. I've done enough for God to be pleased with me. I've I've done enough for God to accept me. What Paul is saying here is that even being the most privileged of the people of Israel, the people of God cannot earn him a restored relationship with Yahweh. Pursuing privilege over Jesus Christ is worthless. See this secondly, second of worthless pursuits is influence. Paul goes on to say, as to the law, he was a Pharisee. The Pharisees, of course, are one of the two main governing bodies in the the Jewish ruling body at this point of time. They were uh, committed to upholding and fulfilling Jewish law, which distinguished them from other people and caused them to be pretty judgmental as a result. Famously, uh, the Pharisees were the, the main group that Jesus battled against in his earthly ministry while he was here on earth. And Paul was aligned with this group. In fact, Paul had significant influence in this group. As to zeal, he says, he was a persecutor of the church. See, Paul was given great responsibility within the Pharisees. He was tasked to take down this, in their minds, perversion of true Judaism that had resulted from this Jesus Christ and was growing in his church. Which brought with it all sorts of clout and influence for Paul which he was more than willing to forsake when he came face to face with Jesus. And unfortunately, this pursuit of of personal influence above God, pursuit of personal influence above loving others has been very well detailed outside the church, certainly, but unfortunately inside the church as well. desire to have control over people for more power. It's a temptation many fall prey to. But it in no way emulates the heart of Christ. Our Lord and Savior, who, Philippians 2, 7, emptied himself. Who, before his ministry began, being tempted in the wilderness, resisted the temptation of the evil one for more influence, Matthew 4 who said, Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, the last will be first and the first what? Last. See, we have become so enamored with influence in our world today. We do everything that we can to posture ourselves to get more influence, to be next to those who have it, to have our own five minutes of fame in their presence, to get pictures taken with those who have influence, to get their autograph. We name drop. We bolster our own influence through our contacts. Listen, God doesn't care about how many people you impress. Personal influence is a worthless thing to pursue ahead of putting Jesus first. 
And the third of worthless pursuits Paul details is achievements. For Paul, as to righteousness under the law, he goes on to say, he was blameless. Now, Paul's not, he's not claiming absolute perfection with this statement, but by all outward human standards, Paul's performance according to religious, the religious observance that he was called to, he was flawless. He'd been so diligent in observing the law of doing the things that were required of him that no one could bring a claim against him in that regard. I mean, his parents even had brought him up. In Acts chapter 23, we read that that Paul was the son of a Pharisee. I mean, his parents did everything that they were supposed to do to bring him up in such a way that he was a blameless young Pharisee, which no doubt would have caused some significant strife in his relationship with them when he decided to abandon it all. But in that, Paul developed the sinful attitude of self-righteousness of confidence and boasting in his own efforts. When the reality is, is that we as sinful human beings have no claim to any inherent righteousness or any righteousness that could be earned. In fact, Isaiah says in Isaiah 64 verse 6, all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. The King James Version said it's, it's like filthy rags. To try to earn our salvation is to miss it entirely. Greater achievement is a worthless pursuit ahead of Jesus. Now, it needs to be said that these things on their own aren't bad. To have the chance to have more influence is great. Be born into a Christian family, praise the Lord for that blessing. Have a wonderful family heritage, amazing. For the Lord to bring you great achievement, awesome. The problem becomes when those things take the place of Jesus Christ in our lives. The problem becomes when those things are elevated to the place that Christ should have in everything that we do. If Jesus really has surpassing worth in my life, if he really is more excellent than anything else, then I'm forsaking all other pursuits. Paul says, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. That word loss that he uses there, that's a financial term. He considers them debts counted against himself in his pursuit of Christ. So if Jesus is really everything to me, then I'm done chasing after worthless things. And I realize In the words of Philip Melanchthon, I contribute only the sin that makes my salvation necessary. So instead, I'm chasing after what's worthy. And Christ's likeness is the ultimate of worthy pursuits for us. And Christ's likeness and the pursuit of it hinges on one thing. Verse 9, faith. This all hinges on faith. Unlike all that Paul has just talked about, the things that he's earned, the things that he's received through his works, which he describes as loss, which he describes as rubbish, faith is unearned. And most simply, faith is to be found in Jesus Christ. It is to be so deep in your pursuit of him that you are literally found in everything that you do in him. To know him. To believe what he says. Not just about what we are supposed to do, but about what he has done for us. Two, as Romans 10 says, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, which results in your salvation. You must confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life, that you are a sinner in need of a savior. Your sins separated you from God. And that was a chasm that you could never cross on your own. Professing belief in his coming to this earth, fully God in fully human form, living a perfect sinless life, and then dying a death you deserved on your behalf. And rising to new life three days later and all that that means for you and how that impacts of every part of who we are. 
Our life ought to be lived sola fide, by faith alone, with faithfulness to Christ as the utmost pursuit in everything that we do. As one commentator said, this passage, speaking of Philippians 3, makes clear that theology and life go together. And the antidote to poor living is proper theology. You want to pursue what is worthy? You want to elevate Jesus Christ to the highest level possible in your life? And the truths about who he is, what he said, and what he did for you need to plumb so deeply into the core of who you are that it impacts everything that comes out from it. If we are to elevate Christ and pursue what's worthy, we must have clear in our minds what he has accomplished for us and believe deep in our hearts what he is accomplishing in us and trust what he will accomplish for us and that impacts every part of who we are. Because you see, being a follower of Jesus Christ is not simply an intellectual pursuit. It's an experiential one. This isn't just about knowing more. This is about living it out more. Because we are not saved by works, but we are certainly saved to works as a result of the salvation that we have received. So we have to live this out as recipients of, see this first, justification. We have been justified in the eyes of God through Jesus Christ. Having faith in Christ results in being clothed in God's righteousness. Not my own, through my own works or or my own obedience, as we see in verse 9. But justification is achieved for us by Jesus Christ and received through him. To be justified, of course, it's a legal term. It is, it is to be declared righteous in the eyes of God. God no longer seeing us with our sinfulness, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, he looks upon us with Jesus's righteousness. Instead of being declared guilty, the holy judge looks at us on the basis of what Christ has done for us and allows us to walk from the courtroom free. To be declared righteous in the eyes of God depends on faith, Paul says. God bestows righteousness on those who are in Christ through faith, which is a distinct contrast between what Paul has detailed already, between the the keeping of the law, which because of our sin could never fully achieve the righteousness that God requires, and the righteousness of Christ that becomes ours through trusting in him, which is that righteousness is imputed to us. It is gifted to us by God through Christ. See, when Jesus declared in John 19, 30, it is finished. He was, in his love, in his grace, in his goodness, declaring the end of sin and its impact in our lives. Sin no longer holds power or weight over those who are in Christ. All who come to him are freed justified, declared to be righteous by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in the sin-stained obedience that we can offer God on the day of judgment, but instead it is in trusting in God's love and grace and goodness to consider you and I not guilty because of Jesus Christ. Amen? And while that is the reality for those of us who are living our lives in Christ alone, through faith alone, we understand that we do still live in the here and now and seek to struggle against sinfulness, which still, unfortunately, lives with us. The vestiges of death still clinging to us. And so, as we are justified, we need to be growing in our, see this next, sanctification. Okay, sanctification. Look down at verse 10. Paul says that I may know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. You see, the process of sanctification, it's a big word. Sanctification is simply put what Paul says there, becoming like him, becoming more like Jesus Christ. 
And if we are to be like Jesus, we, are, we have to live in the power of his resurrection that defeated death, death once and for all, secured our salvation and the new life that we now live in, which truly has the power to transform us from the inside out. You see, the power that was at work that in, in raising Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that is at work in you and I to make us more like him. But of course, that doesn't preclude us from, from harm or difficulty. That doesn't preclude us, of course, from struggling against sin in our lives. In fact, one commentator, his name is George Beasley Murray. He wrote this, Christians must experience the weight of the cross before they taste the power of his resurrection. And so we, as recipients of, of grace and forgiveness by the power of the cross, we must share in the sufferings of Christ. We must pour ourselves out for others as Christ did for, for the will of the Father. We must be willing to go the distance in our pursuit of Christ-likeness. To suffer and even to die for the cause of Christ. And through the power at work within us, put to death sin and its effects in our lives. Because being found in Jesus in this process of sanctification is a daily commitment. It's a daily surrender to God and his plans and his purposes in my life. It is a daily seeking to understand in a greater way the will of the Father by spending time with him in his word. It is a daily communion with God as we spend time communicating with him in prayer, seeking him and his power for these things that he wants to do in us. It is living with a Christ-centered consciousness that every moment, in every conversation, in every interaction, in every work situation, seeking to live our lives for his glory in all that we do. It is, as Jesus called his disciples in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This is what it takes. This is what's at stake. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This we are called to be growing in every single day. A willingness to die daily to ourselves and to live to Christ. In the process of sanctification, of becoming more like him, that he is working in each of us. Until we experience, finally, glorification. You see, righteousness before God comes only from God, and any attempt on our part to earn that through our own efforts is a rejection of the true gospel. And Christ atoned for our sin, paying the price. And so while salvation is not of works, part of the, cons the confirming of our salvation is that we have been called to two works, is that we have been called to be growing in our obedience every day to Christ. And as God empowers us through Christ, then we ought to embrace the life that he called us to by living conforming to the commands of Christ, putting off sin and putting on Jesus Christ because our citizenship is no longer here. The moment that you came to Jesus Christ, receiving the forgiveness of your sins, when God declared you to be righteous, justified you in his sight, you transferred your citizenship from this earth to an eternal citizenship. And to the promise of abundant life now through the working that God is doing in your life, but of eternal life to come. And that's what Paul ends off this section by saying. He says, verse 11, that by any means possible, you see the urgency there? By any means possible. I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in our lives has, has two phases for us, really. The first phase, of course, is what we're talking about, we've talked about already. It's the reality that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ confirms our salvation, then works actively in us every single day as we become more like Jesus Christ. But the second phase of the resurrection power in us occurs when our physical bodies leave this earth and are completely transformed as we are ushered into the joys of eternity. As we are brought into the presence of God, as we are ushered into heaven, 
Resurrection power culminates in our sinfulness completely destroyed. This is the promise that comes with identifying with Jesus Christ. This is what we strive for as those who are called to elevate Jesus above everything else in our lives. As we identify with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, we also get to experience and identify with him completely in his life for all of eternity. Regardless of what we face in this life, believers have the unbelievable hope of what is to come, of the resurrection power alive in us now and the promise of what that resurrection power will result in. And that is us gathering around the throne of God with people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation and no crying or no tears happening anymore, no pain, no hurt, no sin, all of it is gone. As we spend eternity worshiping the Lord and basking in his glorious presence. Our resurrection from the dead effects of sin brings about new life that will come after this life. In Acts chapter 9, we read about when the Apostle Paul met Jesus. Paul was, of course, a persecutor of the church, a Pharisee living apart from the Lord. And Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus in such blinding light that it blinded Paul. And in the moment when Paul came to a realization of the truth of the gospel and professed faith, Scripture details for us that something like scales fell off of his eyes and he could see again. Just like those scales fell off Paul's eyes, so did the passions of his former life. So did the worthless pursuits of this world, of his own sort of self-righteousness. And he opened his eyes anew to the beauty of Jesus, to the worthy pursuit of elevating him above everything else and keeping him at the center of all that he did. And while our conversion stories may not be as wild and crazy as Paul's was. The realities are still the same for us. It is no less wonderful. It is no less transformative. It is no less critical in our lives. So is Jesus really everything to you? Do you know him like this? Is he worth more than anything else in your life? Let me pray for us. God Almighty, in this moment, we bask in the wondrous glory of your love for us. What a truth it is, Lord, to know that while we were still your enemies, you sent your own Son to die a death that we deserve. That we could be restored to you. So that the chasm that existed between us and you could be bridged by the cross. So the power of sin and death may be defeated completely and for all of eternity through your resurrection, Jesus. So Father, I pray that you would help us to live in the wondrous power of that. That the reality of who you are, Jesus, would Go so deeply to the core of who we are that it would impact every single part of us. And we confess in this moment that some of us, myself included, the issues with sin that we've been dealing with, the improper living according to your word that we've been called to is because we have not believed what is true. We have not truly seen the impact, the gravitas of the truth of the gospel. So God, make this the most amazing thing for all of us here. Elevate yourself highest in our lives, we pray, Jesus. Would you cast off the worthless pursuits in our lives that we may glorify you all the more in our lives personally and in this church corporately. Thank you for this time for your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.